Good evening, I'm Shelley Meitzler, Director of Community Education and Resources at the TSC Alliance and your moderator for tonight's final e-webinar series topic, Life Stages Refractory Epilepsy in Adults. The webinar is being recorded. By participating in the webinar, you have consented to the recording and future distribution. The camera setting by default has been turned off for all participants. We encourage you to participate on camera if you feel comfortable doing so, but if you do not wish to be on the recording, please keep your camera off throughout the presentation. I want to thank our presenting sponsors of the 2021 e-webinar series, Greenwich Biosciences, and our national support sponsors, UCB Inc. and Novartis. The Life Stages webinar series is sponsored by Levanova, Lundbeck, Mallinckrodt, Norellis, and Upshur Smith Laboratories. The TSC Alliance hosted monthly educational webinars on a variety of TSC-related topics of interest featuring known experts in the TSC community. These free one-hour presentations included an open question and answer period. The series was composed of educational webinars focusing on four topic areas, life stages of TSC, transition workshops, TSC-associated neuropsychiatric disorders, and research updates and clinical trials. One additional housekeeping item before we get started, everyone's microphones will be muted throughout the, the speaker presentations. Questions for the speakers can be submitted via the chat box and will be asked at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to answer as many questions as time allows. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Drs. Bauer and Crino. Dr. Bauer is a neurologist specializing in caring for patients with epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis complex. He completed medical school and residency training at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center before coming to the University of Virginia. At UVA, he completed two years of fellowship, one year of clinical neurophysiology, and a second year of clinical epilepsy training. Board certified in both neurology and clinical neurophysiology, he joined the UVA neurology faculty in 2017. He serves as the co-director of the Tuberous Sclerosis Clinic, in addition to his clinical duties in the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit and Epilepsy Clinic. Dr. Carino is the TSC Clinic Director at the University of Maryland Medical Center and Chair of the TSC Alliance Board of Directors. He is an internationally recognized physician scientist specializing in developmental brain disorders. His laboratory has researched mechanisms of altered brain development associated with autism, intellectual disability, and epilepsy, defining developmental disorders associated with intractable epilepsy, including autism, hemomegal encephaly, focal cortical dysplasia, and tuberous sclerosis complex, which he has studied extensively. He has collaborated on identifying several new genes associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, pioneered single-cell mRNA and DNA sequencing analysis in resected human tissues, and has used mouse models to plumb the effects of mTOR regulatory genes on cell development in in vitro models using immunocytochemistry, Western essay mRNA expression analysis, gene transfection, and in vitro cell migration essays. Before his appointment to chairman of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Department of Neurology, Dr. Crino was professor and vice chair for research at Temple University School of Medicine Shriners Hospital Pediatric Research Center in Philadelphia. Over the last 20 years, his lab has had continuous funding from the National Institutes of Health, through which he has four grants totaling $4.1 million. He has co-authored 151 peer-reviewed manuscripts, chapters, and reviews, and he has been invited to lecture all over the world. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Drs. Bauer and Kino. Thank you. Thanks, Shelly, for that warm introduction. Thank you, Shelly. Very kind of you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. So glad everyone could join. Well, I'll get started. I got to say, it's an honor to uh, present here with Pete today. He's really a uh, legend and giant in the field of tuber sclerosis. So um, I'll try to try my best to live up to to uh, uh, to my company this evening. So um, uh, everyone, see my slides? Okay, thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, really a pleasure to uh, chat tonight and uh, talk a little bit about an overview of uh, refractory epilepsy and tuber sclerosis. It's a little bit of a daunting uh, topic to cover in such a short amount of time. I'll try to do it justice. 
Um, but uh, I think it'll just hopefully um, supplement the relationships and the ongoing conversations you're already having with your adult neurologic providers. I was asked to include a couple of disclaimers from my uh, home institution. Uh, the uh, discussion tonight is meant to be general for general education purposes and not meant to inform on any particular patient or clinical uh, concern for any particular patient. Um, and the views and uh, what I discussed tonight is my own uh, view and not that of my employer. So a little bit about um, tuberous sclerosis and, and adult epilepsy. Um, you know, epilepsy is one of the more common manifestations of, uh, of tuberous sclerosis complex. Approximately 83% of individuals with tuberous sclerosis uh, uh, have uh, seizures and epilepsy. And the majority of uh, the seizures in adults are described as focal seizures, meaning they're coming from one particular area in the brain, typically in the setting of tuberous sclerosis that will represent a dominant or major tuber or tubers, which are the uh, structural lesions associated with tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, some individuals may have different manifestations, particularly those who may have uh, more refractory epilepsies can have uh, multiple seizure types, um, including those who may have a manifestation known as lennox gastaut syndrome, which is comprised of multiple seizures, including uh, smaller brief tonic seizures, uh, uh, brief absent seizures, which um, are uh, associated with being refractory to medications more typically. So what is refractory epilepsy in the heart of the talk this evening? So refractory epilepsy is defined as epilepsy that does not respond to two medications, which are appropriate uh, relative to one seizure types. Uh, and these, uh, the continued seizures um, must be in the setting of continuing to take medication and are not associated with intolerance to medication. So our, our topic will focus uh, tonight on those who have continued to have seizures despite being on multiple medications uh, that have been tolerated. Uh, the rate of refractory epilepsy, if you consider all comers uh, with epilepsy in uh, general communities, is, approaches 33%. Um, the rate with, uh, within tuberous sclerosis populations in tuberous sclerosis community is likely a bit higher, though, with uh, the rate uh, reported to be somewhere between 40 and 60 percent, depending on the study population and the study age uh, contained within those studies. Another um, brief disclaimer is just on the um, level of evidence in discussing manifestations of epilepsy in adults with tuberous sclerosis. Um, this is a relatively um, less studied topic compared to children. So uh, a lot of the um, data we'll talk about tonight focus um, on adults, but um, a lot of it is derived from uh, data that includes children and adults with very little data looking at adults in particular. Um, despite that limitation, the rates of refractory epilepsy seem to be fairly similar across the age spectrum in the reported literature. And the uh, uh, refractory epilepsy is not dependent on a singular genetic uh, mutation or genetic variant associated with tuberous sclerosis, whether it's TSC1, 2, or for those who may not have a genetic abnormality. Um, one uh, trend within the literature uh, does seem to be those who have a normal cognitive function seem to have lower rates of refractory epilepsy, but even within those communities and those populations of TSC patients, the rate of refractory epilepsy is still relatively high, approaching 30%. So um, pause for a moment and talk about those who have well-controlled epilepsy or some on the call who may not have epilepsy at all. Uh, one of the uh, unique aspects of uh, neurologic manifestation of tuberous sclerosis is the um, heavy incidence of uh, epilepsy presenting in the first few years of life with a relative diminishing incidence over the course of the age spectrum. Um, the rate of uh, epilepsy of, above the age of 18 is uh, reported to be 10% or less in the few studies that have looked at the rate of uh, development of epilepsy within tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, there's no real evidence-based um, methodology or uh, recommendations for um, uh, management and continued uh, excellent control of seizures within the adult uh, TSC community. However, there has been some studies looking at, you know, what are factors that may cause epilepsy to become uncontrolled in well-controlled populations and general epilepsy populations. And I thought I'd just include this for um, uh, completion, which would include factors of continuing to take medications regularly, sleep um, and a good sleep hygiene with a regular schedule, as well as stress mitigation and stress management, which are all factors which may have an influence on seizure control and those who are doing well without seizures. 
So uh, kind of taking it just a basic approach to refractory epilepsy, I think there's really kind of two paradigms to it. One is continued medication management, which uh, Dr. Prino will speak a bit too in terms of uh, particularly the mTOR pathway as a novel mechanism looking at um, treatment for uh, refractory epilepsy. But certainly there's uh, uh, all kinds of new medications um, uh, um, consistently coming available to the market which uh, may very well prove effective in tuberous sclerosis. Many of them have not been studied in tuberous sclerosis in particular, but have been studied in refractory epilepsy populations. So any of the, the new medications that come to market may be considered with patients with tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, I want to focus, though, uh, on more the non-medication options um, that may be considered in tuberous sclerosis uh, complex. So those uh, primarily consist of diet, and, and dietary interventions for seizures, as well as surgical and device options uh, in the setting of refractory epilepsy. In, uh, in thinking through the surgical options, um, there's really two primary considerations uh, in this um, kind of clinical pathway. Uh, one is uh, a resective surgery. Um, there's a lot of different um, workup and consideration that go into determining is there a single source of seizure onset? Is there a single tuber or primary manifestation uh, of the central nervous system tuber sclerosis um, that may be the source of seizures? And if that can be determined um, through, a, it's a, not just a single one test, it's a kind of correlation of multiple tests, including EEG monitoring, capturing seizures, MRI data, um, imaging data of the brain, and uh, also cognitive memory tests. They're all correlated together. Uh, and if it sounds complicated, it's because it is. It really requires a team to, uh, to uh, correlate and get all of these data in alignment to determine as a group, is surgery of this nature possible uh, in the setting of refractory uh, epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis. Um, sometimes it may even require next steps, which could include invasive EEG monitoring that include electrodes placed either on the surface of the brain or in the brain. And that only comes uh, through um, all of that initial process that I've already alluded to. There's a lot of factors that uh, once you consider if you're faced with you know, these non-medication options in the, the setting of refractory tuber sclerosis. One is you know, uh, uh, assuring that your neurologist has epilepsy expertise. So obviously all neurologists have some expertise in, uh, in epilepsy. However, the added expertise that comes with the treatment of refractory epilepsy uh, may be best in the hands of someone who has uh, clinical neurophysiology and or epilepsy training to ensure uh, expertise for the management of refractory epilepsy. Another aspect is the, the, uh, the, uh, the complexity of the um, care received. Um, that there's a accrediting body that uh, evaluates the care of, at epilepsy centers, uh, which is called the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, the NAEC. And the highest level uh, care is provided through level four epilepsy centers. And if uh, uh, complex epilepsy surgery is considered, it is typically done at level four centers. Certainly, many tuber sclerosis center, um, uh, TSC Alliance, um, uh, clinics are associated with level four centers, but not all of them. So that would be another factor to consider um, in the course of care, um, especially if seizures remain uncontrolled. And it, you know, if you have questions or concerns about you know the expertise that you you have with your care, definitely ask your, your uh, treatment treating provider, your neurologist, and your care team about these aspects. And certainly, if uh, you know if there's a need to either consideration for a device or a resective surgery, um, asking about uh, expertise with epilepsy surgery and tuberous sclerosis patients is totally a fair question to ask your providers. So uh, as I mentioned, devices are uh, another option. Now there's many different devices in the setting of uh, refractory epilepsy. Those include uh, responsive neurostimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, and deep brain stimulation. Um, these options really help reduce seizure burden and do not typically lead to seizure freedom, though in some uh, rare instances they may. Um, you know, the, the other factor to consider with these devices is the compatibility with continued monitoring of TSC manifestations. 
For example, some of the devices like the vagal nerve stimulator that has a component in the chest wall may prove difficult with some institutions for getting surveillance imaging to include MRIs of the abdomen if they're needed. And that's really uh, dependent on the center um, uh, which you, from which you receive care and something certainly you need to coordinate and consider with your multidisciplinary care team. So um, talking about the, the different options, it's really kind of an exciting time uh, in the, uh, looking at devices. And uh, just in my time of being a physician in the last uh, 10 years or so, there's been a really an expansion in the, the knowledge for devices in the setting of tuberous sclerosis. Um, most recently, um, there's been uh, kind of clinical uh, case series and clinical uh, studies looking at either the vagus nerve stimulation, which is one of the well, uh, more tried and true options in terms of its duration it's been on the market um, compared to uh, options like the responsive nervous stimulator, which actually is partially done at Pete's Institution, University of Maryland, looking at um, actually respond, uh, re responsive devices to electrical signals on the brain to help control seizures. So, um, and kind of just touching base on a, a few of those options, though certainly not um, uh, considering all of them, the two that have the, have the most data which again is mostly in case series and not um, uh, large trials in the TSC community, but have been uh, performed in large trials in the general epilepsy population. Uh, the vagus nerve simulator is a device that's uh, planted in the chest wall. It does not respond uh, to any sort of uh, stimulus uh, in the brain, but does um, every, uh, some options can respond to changes in heart rate, which can be associated with seizure activity. Um, and has been shown to have an influence on seizure tendency and can certainly reduce the burden of seizures. But as I mentioned before, these options don't typically lead to complete seizure freedom. Um, and as I mentioned, this uh, has been studied and documented in TSC patients uh, dating back to the mid to late uh, 20 aughts, 2005, 2009, or when the an, uh, initial reports in the TSC community came out. And then the responsive neurostimulator is relatively new in terms of its report in the tuberous sclerosis population. It's been, uh, it's a device that uh, typically requires that uh, more invasive monitoring first, but then it's implanted in uh, uh, actually with the electrodes touching or in the brain to help reduce seizure burden by actually trying to disrupt the seizures before the signals um, we register propagate and create um, full uh, clinical seizure activity. Overall, um, the uh, efficacy for these, again, it's I mean, to, uh, means to uh, reduce seizure burden with the data for both of these options, uh, resulting in between 50 and 60% reduction in seizures in 50% uh, of people who receive these options, which uh, is kind of a, 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 a two-sided coin uh, with uh, approximately 50% of patients not seeing that 50% reduction in seizures. So depending on how you process that and, and discuss with your uh, treatment providers, it may be a meaningful measure or not. So as a duplicate side, and lastly, I wanna to touch base uh, briefly about diet options. So diet uh, has been studied both in refractory epilepsies and the general um, uh, epilepsy communities, as well as in case series uh, in, in tuberous sclerosis complex as well. Uh, the data for it is actually very similar to the devices I mentioned, which is about 50% of the people uh, or patients who have these devices placed see a 50% reduction in seizures. So uh, there are options that uh, can help ameliorate or reduce seizure burden, uh, but will not lead to seizure freedom. Certainly there are um, patients, uh, patients in cases where the uh, seizure uh, reduction may be significantly more than that uh, quoted 50% number. Um, it, it is something though that is um, a little bit more difficult in terms of the longitudinal aspect of it because it is a very strict diet with relative high uh, um, uh, overhead in terms of uh, cost as well as just the day-to-day -day navigation of it. And it's not something that uh, should be done without the supervision of a uh, treating neurologist with expertise in diet uh, therapies and setting of epilepsy. Um, right at my 15 minutes, Pete. So um, I'll uh, hand it over to Pete to talk about the um, medication uh, aspects of uh, refractory epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis. Sure, great. Thanks, Derek. It was a great job and it is great to be able to uh, 
partake in this seminar tonight with you, Derek. And uh, Derek's a new, uh, it's kind of a fresh face in the TSC world, and he brings great expertise and great knowledge. And so uh, we're really, uh, really glad you decided to see, join the uh, TSC world, Derek. It's really, really great. So, uh, so, so welcome to the group. Um, I'm going to just shift over and share my screen, if that's okay. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit really uh, about uh, mTOR inhibitors in adult TSC epilepsy, because this has really been um, uh, an area that's quite exciting. And, you know, as Derek mentioned, there really haven't been a whole lot of trials to look at the existing known anti-seizure medicines and their effectiveness in tuberous sclerosis complex. So many of you may be familiar with medications such as uh, Dilantin or Depakote or Lamictal or Topamax and the many seizure medicines that are used to treat epilepsy across a wide variety of disorders. There have been actually very few kind of big studies that have addressed particular effectiveness of those medications, either alone or in combination, in tuberous sclerosis complex. Moreover, there's nothing particularly specific or mechanistic about those medications in the underlying kind of pathophysiology or the underlying cause of tuberous sclerosis complex. And as many of you know, um, you hear it at the national meetings, at the family conference, you know, we know a lot about this um, cellular signaling pathway, which is known as mTOR. Um, and it really has provided us with an opportunity to actually have a target pathway that we can um, uh, really approach therapeutically to treat many different aspects of tuberous sclerosis. Now, I will not touch on the effectiveness of mTOR inhibitors in renal angiomyelopoma, in pulmonary LAM, or in subependymal giant cell tumor. I'll really confine the remarks just to, um, to epilepsy because the data has actually been, been quite compelling. So just by way of uh, reminder, uh, tuberous sclerosis complex um, really, as you all know, is results from mutation in these two genes. And I just want to share this because we realize that um, when there is a mutation in either of those two genes, that function of that uh, encoded protein is lost. And then there's this cellular signaling molecule right here, which is called mTOR, which is vital for the normal daily operations of virtually every cell system in the body, but particularly in the central nervous system, uh, becomes uh, dysregulated and loses uh, its ability to be, to be shut off. So normally what happens is TSC1 and TSC2 kind of act to keep this in control, try to kind of regulate it and keep it in abeyance. But when we have a mutation, basically TOR signaling proceeds unchecked. So this is an MRI of a, of a brain of a patient with tuberous sclerosis. This is a tuber right here that you can see. And if we were to take this tuber and look at it microscopically, all of the brown spots that you see here are basically cells within the tuber that are showing very, very abnormally high levels of mTOR signaling, suggesting that you know, shutting down or lowering the amount of mTOR signaling might have a uh, productive endpoint in uh, many of the central nervous system manifestations of TSC, not just epilepsy, but also the features of TAN. This pathway is also relevant to subependymal tumors. This is a slide, it's an old slide, but it really is a seminal piece of work. This was work from Michael Wong's laboratory. And as many of you know, we have mouse models that we use to study and understand the mechanisms of tuberous sclerosis. And you don't have to understand the molecular biology here, but suffice it to say, this is a mouse model in which the TSC1 uh, gene was, uh, was removed. It basically models what we see in human tuberous sclerosis. Um, and there are a variety of different things that we see in the brain of these animals. So the, there is um, exuberant amounts of cellular overgrowth. The brains are actually a little bit bigger um, than the uh, unaffected brains. But what I really wanna show you down here, this is important. This is seizure frequency, and this is age of the animal. These animals actually develop spontaneous seizures. And what Mike's lab showed is that if you begin to treat these animals with an mTOR inhibitor, basically a compound that inhibits the activation of mTOR, and there's really only two of them that we have available to us. One of them is rapamycin, which is also marketed as serolimus, and the other one is everolimus, which is marketed as, as a finitor. Many of you may have family members, loved ones, or yourselves be being treated with these medications. What you can see is this is the seizure frequency right here in this curve. And you can see that in the untreated animals, so V, V E H means vehicle, these animals just got a saline solution. Basically, they develop very aggressive and avid seizures by a few weeks after birth. In contrast, if you treat these animals early on, you can see that the seizure frequency is basically completely shut off. There's no seizures that appear. So this was the first animal model that gave us great promise that we might be able to inhibit this pathway in a clinical paradigm in human beings and move to clinical trials. 
This is another mouse model. This is the TSC1 Synapse and Cree mouse. And these animals also had spontaneous seizures. Here's the mouse right here. Here's the EEG showing the spontaneous seizures. And indeed, in these animals as well, if you treat them with rapamycin, you can stop them from having seizures. Here's yet another model. This is a model that's actually um, a mouse that has the ability to, to turn on TOR, not during the embryologic or fetal period, but actually during adulthood. Um, and this is a very sophisticated bit of uh, cellular uh, molecular science. Um, and what they were able to show here is that when you um, turn on the mTOR pathway by knocking out TSC1 in these adult mice, they start having seizures very, very aggressively. And yes, indeed, you can block these seizures with mTOR inhibitors such as rapamycin. So several mouse models, in addition to some cell culture models and other animal model systems, clearly demonstrated that inhibiting the mTOR signaling pathway at the right time uh, in animal species can um, stop seizures from occurring. So that led the way to some early uh, limited clinical trials and then ultimately a really substantial clinical trial that came out. Um, this trial was published in 2016 in The Lancet. Jackie French was the lead author. David Franz was the senior author on the manuscript. Um, and basically what these uh, investigators demonstrated was that Treating uh, adults with an mTOR inhibitor ages 2 to 65 who have refractory onset seizures. So that's to say seizures that have not responded to at least two medicines either by themselves or in combination can be uh, seen to have a benefit of mTOR inhibition in terms of seizure frequency. Now, in this case, they use the medication Everolimus, marketed as Affinitor. Um, and the paper actually demonstrated that if you kind of look at the dosage ranges, you can get variable uh, effects. And so what they did was they looked at this age group, age two to 65. That doesn't mean you can't use it in someone older than 65, but this is the trial entry criteria. They used... Um, dosage ranges that yielded levels in the blood of five to seven nanograms per mil, and then later at the higher dose, five to 15 nanograms per mil. They did average dosing on the basis of milligrams per meter squared of body surface area that they calculated out. For the lower dose group that gives you the lower level, that dose was 5.2 milligrams per meter squared. For the higher dose group, it was 7.5 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, and then you can see over here, these are the varying phases, the initial phase, 18 weeks, 48 weeks, and then 96 weeks, you can see the relative um, efficacy and reduction uh, of seizures across the entire uh, cohort. Um, and the primary endpoint in this study was to look at the baseline and frequency of seizures during the uh, maintenance period. So once they were started on the medicine, how did they do over time? Um, and the response rate was defined as the number of individuals achieving at least 50% reduction in seizure frequency. So let's pause and think about that for a minute. If you have five seizures a month, that means that you would go down to two, about two to three seizures per month. So maybe not that much of a clinical improvement. Whereas if you have 20 seizures a month, reducing it to 10 actually may have a significant reduction in morbidity and burden to you in terms of you know, emergency room visits, calls to your physician, emergent visits to the doctor's office. Um, so clearly showing a benefit. And by the way, this metric of 50% reduction in seizure frequency, this is generally applied to most anti-seizure medication trials. This is sort of what we look for as defining effectiveness, not cure, by the way, not making someone seizure free, but really largely making them a 50% reduction. Um, and if you look down here, the median uh, percent reduction was 14% with the placebo and 29.3 and 39% with high dose Everolimus. So clearly a benefit that was statistically significant. This study was then followed up with an extension trial, again, from Dr. French and Dr. Franz, demonstrating that indeed Everolimus does work well in patients with treatment refractory epilepsy and TSC within the age group um, that is two to 65. Uh, so lots of adults uh, in that age group and even older adults, by the way, right? People in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, not just thinking about treating uh, pediatric patients. Uh, there was an extension trial that was done in Japan as a sub study that also demonstrated a benefit of uh, Everolimus in individuals with intractable epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis. And the paradigm for all of these studies, by the way, was the addition of, of uh, Everolimus onto the existing seizure medicines that people were uh, taking. And essentially, if you look through the trial, essentially almost every seizure medicine was represented from oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, vigabatrin, lamictal, uh, really just, just the whole uh, panoply of usual anti-seizure medicines. So it seems to be able to be added on to to essentially the broad range of anti-seizure medicines that we often use as first-line agents in tuberous sclerosis complex. So the summary is that in fact, um, 
mTOR inhibitors provide a very attractive strategy to treat medically intractable epilepsy uh, in TSC. And of course, that's in addition to their benefit on renal angiomyelopomas, pulmonary lamb, and subependymal giant cell tumors. The indication for epilepsy now is an FDA approved uh, indication. So you can treat patients with TSC with everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor, um, simply for the indication of epilepsy. Um, you can also, if you cannot tolerate everolimus, you can also switch over to serolimus. The data isn't quite the same, but the drugs are basically pharmacologically identical. And so there should be no difficulty switching it around. I will say that the benefit that was seen in the EXIST trial and in the subsequent extension, as well as the Japanese trial, uh, was the higher dose. So aiming for levels that are upwards of 10 to 15 with a higher dosage seems to be more effective in the treatment of epilepsy. I'm gonna pivot very briefly here and talk about cannabidiol or CBD. Um, this, uh, as many of you know, is marketed also as Epidiolex. There were a couple of early studies which demonstrated the efficacy of, of cannabidiol in treatment responsive epilepsy in individuals who had atonic seizures or drop seizures in the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, and again, there's Dr. Thiel, Dr. French, so some names that, that uh, people know very well. And then a subsequent study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and in JAMA Neurology demonstrated a clear benefit of cannabidiol for drug-resistant epilepsy in Dravet syndrome. Now, Dravet syndrome, as you know, is very different from tuberous sclerosis. It's a different gene that's mutated. It has a different clinical presentation, but it does share with TSC the presence of often intractable epilepsy that is unresponsive to multiple uh, medications. Um, and so it wasn't really a big leap of faith to see the efficacy in this genetic epilepsy syndrome as well as the efficacy in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and many individuals with tuberous sclerosis complex will actually have a uh, epilepsy phenotype or an epilepsy seizure type that is the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So atonic seizures, tonic seizures, um, ab atypical absences, and variable degrees of intellectual disability. Those are the defining features of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, and so there was, oopsie, there was subsequent work uh, that Dr. Thiel led, also Dr. Bebin, um, a number of individuals that, that many of you are familiar with, Michael Wong, um, to look at the effect of cannabidiol for drug-resistant seizures in TSC. And clearly this medication, when dosed, really at doses higher than what were reported in the DRAVE trial, which was 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day, dosing upwards to 25 uh, milligrams per kilogram per day, even up as high as 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, um, can demonstrate efficacy in reducing seizures in these patients. So, so uh, a very attractive finding that, that we have yet another medication in our armamentarium uh, to potentially treat intractable seizures. And then this was subsequently expanded uh, in another extension trial. And again, this was led by, by Dr. Uh, Thiel. So, um, you know, what, what I, I think is important based on what you've heard from Derek and I is that you know, not everybody with epilepsy and TSC has intractable epilepsy. That's to say that they have continuous ongoing seizures that are refractory to medicines. In my practice, and I'm sure Dr. Bauer in your practice, you have people who do very well with one or two medication and are seizure-free and doing fine. Unfortunately, though, there is an enrichment of individuals who have pretty troublesome epilepsy, require multiple medication trials, and often end up coming to either an evaluation for epilepsy surgery, a device-based therapy, or some other type of um, um, approach. Um, I think what's attractive about mTOR inhibitors is that since these medications act directly on the cellular pathway that is affected by the mutation of TSC1 and TSC2, um, we actually can refer to mTOR inhibitors as a form of a disease modifying therapy. It's actually modifying the effect of the gene mutation uh, on the body's metabolism. So, so it really is, is quite exciting. The other issue, of course, is that just as a paradigm, now that we have one that is a disease modifying therapy, we're beginning to look at other possibilities of other pathways that we can, um, that we can uh, exploit as disease modifying therapies. Uh, cannabidiol also is just a very, very strong anti-seizure medicine, and it looks as though it has promising efficacy in, in tuberous sclerosis complex uh, as well. Um, so uh, that was all I was going to cover, and I guess we want to leave some time over for discussion. So uh, Shelly, do you want me to start addressing the um, um, uh, chat questions or? Okay, Yeah, great. if you don't mind, that'd be great. Sure. So there was a question up above uh, from Joan Riddler. Hi, Ms. Riddler. How are you doing? Um, hope Bill's doing okay. Um, just wanted, I guess it was, what about scar tissue? Could removal of it stop and possibly increase? Derek, I think that was for you. Was that referring to the Vegas nerve simulator? I, I don't know what that question was response to. Um, it was basically about the scar tissue. My son has scar tissue. If 
from a Sega removal and okay. um, doesn't have complete seizure control. And they're, they're telling me they want me to, to have surgery. And I'm like thinking, well, could he get more seizures from having surgery or is it a good idea to, you know, go after that? I just yeah. keep putting it off. <laughs> that, that, that's a tough one because the, you know, um, my talk centered more on the uh, endogenous or the inherent uh, uh, components of tuberous sclerosis causing seizures, but there are uh, the potential of, um, uh, you know, the treatments or the, you know, the surgical options resulting in scar tissue that could present seizures. I think that's something you'll have to talk with your neurologist to sort out is, you know, did you have to figure out, is it coming from the scar tissue or you know, from the remaining tuber uh, burden? So, uh, and the remaining endogenous aspects of the tuber sclerosis. So that's a, a complex question you know, that uh, requires a lot of consideration and would have to uh, delve into the details with your primary neurologist to sort out, you know, is it from the um, something from a previous surgery or is it from the, the tubers itself? So it's a really important consideration, but I think it's something that would require a lot of conversation with your treating provider to, to sort out. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And, and I would say, Ms. Riddler, it's, it's, um, it is interesting uh, that it is uncommon, is exceedingly uncommon for patients to get uh, worse after epilepsy surgery. It's just not something we see. If you look at temporal lobectomies outside of the world of TSC, people who have intractable epilepsy, who have, epilepsy who have temporal lobectomies, very, very small number of them, probably less than 5%, either just don't get better or may get worse. Um, so the surgical process of taking out brain tissue to treat epilepsy uh, does not seem to engender or leave behind a scar that causes subsequent seizures. It, it's just not a thing that happens. And I think it's unlike a brain injury scar, which is kind of ragged and raw and has bleeding. And the, the surgical scar is just done in a very elegant and clean way. So no, I, I, would, not be, I would not be concerned about, uh, about that as a, as a cause of seizures. That's, that's not usually the way it goes. Even Sega surgery, I, I would make, make that case. Very good, thanks. Yep, for sure. Um, so, uh, Reiko, I had a question about uh, the interactions between Everolimus and Epidiolex. Um, I'm, I'm sure both Derek and I have patients who are on both medications, and um, I have to say, I, I've not seen it be a major problem. Um, I'm generally using the Epidiolex for, and I'm, I'm using the name Epidiolex, the cannabidiol um, for treatment of epilepsy, and the Everolimus may be for epilepsy, but it may also be for renal angiomyolipoma, it may be for pulmonary LAM, um, and I have not seen major drug interactions interactions. From a kinetic perspective, the drugs don't seem to really interact all that much. Um, and most people are able to take them uh, well. Diarrhea is a side effect of CBD. I was part of the data safety monitoring board to look at some of the uh, safety data. Uh, Epidiolex cannabidiol is, a, is actually a very, very safe medication, uh, but diarrhea can be a side effect that some people uh, note um, in the trials that Dr. Teal published in TSC. Um, the incidence of side effects clearly went up as you escalated the dose uh, up above 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, so it may be that you begin to hit a bit of a ceiling as you get into the 30 and 35 plus milligrams per kilogram per day. But I have to say in my straw poll of people are on the two drugs and what I've read in the literature, I have not found the two to have major uh, or serious adverse effects. Derek, do you have any other, any other thing to add? I think uh, Darcy's group came out with a study last year that was in pediatric neurology that said that there may be a, um, some uh, synergistic reaction with a little bit of boosting of the Everolimus level, but I don't think it um, has been shown to have any sort of clinical impact overall in terms of tolerability or anything. So I, I think it's more in uh, that it can change the numbers, but you know, as you mentioned, that the overall influence is we see more positive benefits in some instances with those numbers being a, a, a tad higher. There's been a couple of studies in animal models, so zebrafish and mouse, to suggest that CBD um, uh, may. Um, may also actually have some anti-mTOR effects, so and some mTOR inhibitory effects. So you may get some synergy there as well. It's been less well-defined. Um, remember that um, the, the levels that we use in TSC are largely derived from what we've learned in the oncology field. Um, there really are not normative levels for what to do in TSC. So we're kind of extrapolating. And the truth is, you know, we use numbers like five to seven, five to 15, but you know, I have lots of people who are 
being treated now who levels in the 18 to 20s and they they feel just fine and so so i'm not so sure that we uh that we have to be all that concerned about levels of everolimus i check them largely to make sure you've got adequate amounts in your in your bloodstream uh but certainly uh, i've not been worrying about uh, about extreme toxicity in the levels of 15 to 20 people seem to tolerate it just fine just fine um so Affinitor sounds very promising for the TSC commuting community. Uh, what is your recommendation for dealing with side effects, particularly immune suppression, especially during this time of COVID? Yeah, it's a very challenging question. Uh, so thanks for that. We, we addressed this during the early phases of COVID um, in terms of were, we wrote several position statements from the Alliance in terms of, you know, should we stop Everolimus or Affinitor or the broad class of mTOR inhibitors in patients uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic? And we convened a panel of experts and, and the resounding answer was, was absolutely not. So the risk to you of uh, getting COVID-19, um, it really does not seem to be affected by whether you're on an mTOR inhibitor or not. We have pretty good data on that. There certainly was not an epidemic of COVID-19 infections within TSC uh, patients, either here or internationally. Uh, we had collaborators in Italy where they were just swamped with COVID-19 originally, and we really were just not seeing uh, an epidemic in people with TSC or people being treated with mTOR inhibitors. Remember, the, the immunomodulatory or immunosuppressant effects of mTOR inhibitors are actually fairly mild um, in terms of giving you severe infections. No one gets what are called opportunistic infections, which are severe, difficult to treat infections. It tends to be more kind of sniffles and colds and skin rash infections. Uh, we've had ringworm, people getting acne. Um, so as far as it being a potent immunosuppressant, I, I have not been all that concerned. We wrote a position statement about this and um, certainly did not think that people should stop taking their mTOR inhibitor uh, for fear of contracting uh, COVID. We, we wrote that in, in the initial position statement from the Alliance uh, way, way back in April of April or May of 20, I think. So we, we were pretty, pretty far in front of that. Um, Derek, do you want to take, uh, there's a question here. Uh, do you know the names of the newer drugs that are on the horizon? Um, do you mean uh, anti-seizure medicines or, yeah, seizure medicine? Do you want to tackle that? I, I'm happy to do it, whichever. Sure. I, either way, you know, I, I tend to focus on the, the latest, greatest that are on the market rather than the ones that are coming to the market because we never know if they are or aren't. And, you know, the, the names have are, are, don't have those trendy kind of brands to them. You know, certainly rivaracetam is one of the, the, the newer medicines in the, the levoteracetam family that has an influence. And it's been shown to be relatively tolerated medication. Uh, there's also uh, cinnabamate, which is one of the new medicines that has just come to market. Uh, that have uh, uh, kind of uh, been in the last three to four years. Um, uh, there's others that are, uh, you know, actively uh, being developed, but those are two of the the newer ones. Pete, if I'm missing any of the the kind of on the newer side. Um, to, yeah, to I mean, reference. those are the two that um, I've seen the most, or uh, I've been uh, using them. Yeah, I think the only other one that's going to be exciting is fintepla, which is fenfluramine, which is indicated for Drave syndrome. And just like, um, you know, cannabidiol made the jump from uh, Drave to TSC, it'll be interesting if fintepla makes the jump from Drave syndrome to, to TSC. Uh, it's unclear. It seems to work very mechanistically in Drave syndrome, so, so I'm not really clear. Um, I will say there are a number of medicines that are coming actually from our own preclinical consortium in the TSC Alliance that look very promising in preclinical mouse models of seizures in TSC. And many of them, believe it or not, are like mTOR inhibitors. They're just another cell signaling pathway that are disease modifying pathways. And so you know, a good paradigm is to think about cancer treatment, right? When you think about cancer treatment, it's unusual for someone to just take one cancer drug. Usually it's a combination of therapies. Um, the truth of the matter is in TSC, we're probably going to be evolving something that's that's very uh, similar uh, to that as well. Um, so there's always, you know, a bunch of medicines coming down the pike. I think Sinobamate, absolutely, Brivaracetam looks promising. Um, and Fintepla, we'll see where that, where that goes. Uh, and then, you know, some of the things that are coming out of the preclinical consortium are, are very, very exciting. And I would just say that that's um, all based on data for general refractory epilepsy populations. There's not anything inherently that's been studied in the TSC community for these medications. So it's not like these are uh, TSC specific recommendations. Those are just two of the more, uh, in terms of referencing your question for newer medications that have come to market that are more commonly prescribed. Um, also to qualify that by saying all the, all of the medications that have come to market 
uh, it's in terms of non-inferiority to some of our older medicines. So it's not saying that the new medicines are any better, so to speak, than the older medications. So there, and there may be some mitigation of side effects, but you know, really picking old medicine, new medicine, uh, it's really something that has to be kind of individual decision making with your provider based upon side effects profile and other considerations with the other medications um, that um, a, a person may be on at any given time. There was a question here, a uh, comment on the use of cannabis products containing THC for seizure control. Um, you know, THC is tetrahydrocannabinol, and um, that's the thing that makes you want to listen to the Grateful Dead and eat Doritos and get high. So that's the, that's the part of marijuana that makes you high. Um, and uh, so it's got a very complicated relate, relationship with epilepsy. Um, unlike CBD, which has a fairly linear effect on, uh, uh, on seizures and evolution of um, seizures, the propagation of seizures, THC may have a sort of a biphasic curve, which is that at very, very low doses, it may function as an anti-seizure medication, but at middle and high doses, it actually may be a pro-seizure medicine. Now, some of the early days of uh, medical marijuana, I remember the studies coming out of Colorado, we had Charlotte's Web and Haley's Hope and all these different um, non-proprietary or semi-proprietary medications. They were generally an admixture of CBD uh, as well as tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. Remember that if you actually look at the chemical compounds that are present in cannabis, cannabis being cannabis sativa, the plant that grows to become the, um, you know, marijuana, uh, there's over 400 compounds there. And cannabidiol is just but one of them. There's cannabivarin, cannabibrevin. There's all kinds of different things that are being investigated right now. Um, THC works by a very different mechanism. It binds to specific receptors in the brain called cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. Um, CBD doesn't seem to really interact there, and it has other different pharmacologies uh, than, than THC. So I think the really the fairly profound effect of pure CBD on epilepsy, I think really is a testament to the fact that it is a single compound that has known effectiveness and has a very linear relationship with um, seizure onset and propagation. I think TSC, a THC is a bit more fraught at this point. Um, and so I, just in terms of what I'm recommending in my read of the literature, um, I, I think probably if you're gonna use a, a cannabinoid agent, probably CBD would be, uh, would be the way to go and, and, and avoid, avoid the other medicines, because you just really never know quite how much is getting metabolized, how much is getting transported to the brain, and how much is really uh, acting as a, a pharmacoactive compound. And I would just also um, echo that, and I would also qualify that, you know, there's different forms of CBD. There is the FDA-approved uh, cannabidiol uh, compound, which is, you know, a cloned, uh, very singular compound that's in high concentration and known concentration as compared to the uh, over-the-counter agents, which really there's no uh, regulatory oversight in many of them to know uh, what's in them, as well as the content of this, the relative amount of CBD. So at least when I, I discuss and think through CBD, that's, I'm referring to the FDA-approved compound and not the over-the-counter uh, agent, which uh, really there's no way to comment on safety, efficacy, or tolerability of any of those agents because they haven't been studied and truly, there's no way of regulating what's in them um, to comment on that. So there's a question here. Um, um, my son is 24 and it sounds like has pretty significant sleep problems. Uh, the question is, could you tell me about any medications with TS patients to help with sleep? And uh, boy, I tell you, I, that's a real challenge. Uh, sleep in TSC is, is a huge challenge. I will say sleep in adults with autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability of all causes remains a major challenge. Um, and whether it's related to the underlying genetic uh, mutation that happens in TSC, disrupting the kind of the circadian rhythms in the systems in the brain that generate sleep-wake cycles, uh, or whether it's something else, whether it's having epilepsy, whether it's the comorbidity of epilepsy plus autism plus seizure medicine, it, it's, it's very, very challenging. Suffice it to say that it's been a uniform observation in 30 years of practice that I've heard about. Uh, usually what I do is parents come in and or family members will tell me that. And then I will uh, stupidly and presumptively say, well, have you tried melatonin? And then they usually go, 
ha 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 ha. And yeah, we we're eating bottles of melatonin and it doesn't work. And then I just feel dumb. Um, so, you know, it's a major challenge and melatonin really often just does not cut it even at very high doses, you know, 10, 15 milligrams more than what you should get over the counter. Um, the challenge is if you start getting into actual sleeper medicines, right? So thinking about benzodiazepine medicines like Valium, lorazepam, uh, you know, Xanax, cl uh, clonazepam, clonopin, um, even Ambien, which is Zolpidem, right? Um, you know, it's another central nervous system acting compound. Um, the sleep doctors tell me that the best remedy for sleep disorders is a rigorous sleep hygiene schedule, which is really trying to stick to a schedule, getting to bed every night at a certain time waking up at a certain time, that doesn't answer the challenge of awakening in the middle of the night. And, you know, I have lots and lots of patients who get up in the middle of the night and they sit in bed and they kind of talk, you know, chatter, maybe play video games, maybe go on their iPad. Um, sometimes they get up and wander the house. It, it's a real major challenge. And uh, I, I have to be frank, I have no, um, no magic bullet here for that. Derek, I don't know if you have a, a better response. It really is a challenge. Yeah, you know, I, I would echo kind of that sleep hygiene uh, factor as being the biggest influencer that I've had uh, any success with in non-pharmacologic means. But, you know, if it requires pharmacologic uh, considerations, it's really tough, especially trying to avoid any sedation during the daytime uh, with the medications that are already on from a seizure purpose. So it is really one of the challenges um, in adult TSC, certainly. I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, sleep is an area that I think in TSC, we need a little, actually, frankly, a, bit, a little bit better representation in terms of having sleep professionals. We just don't have that many. Um, there were two good papers that were published on this. Mark Zervis's group published a paper where they made a conditional knockout of one of the TSC genes in the uh, thalamus in the brain. And then Helen Badup's group uh, had a really nice paper where they knocked out one of the genes in the basal ganglia. Both of those animals actually, those animal strains actually have disrupted sleep-wake cycles. So we actually may have a bit of a model to study this. Um, so, you know, whether it's going to be just fixing the mTOR signaling problem or whether it's some ancillary pathway, it, it's unclear. And remember, just having epilepsy itself, many individuals with epilepsy at night, if they have abnormal discharges in their EEG, will be awakened by that. So poor sleep hygiene is, is really a, a challenge for, for all epilepsy patients of all, of all uh, etiologies, all causes. So it's, yeah, it's really vexing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer for you. It's really, really vexing. Um, so here's a question. Uh, my son is 43 and has severe form of uh, epilepsy since six years old, uncontrolled seizures, now with many medicines in a VNS. He's been on Afinitor for the last five years and his seizures are very reduced, but he still has a few per month, just wondering how all this is affecting him. Well, you know, it's a good thing that the Afinitor may have had an effect and you're seeing a reduction in seizures. It may also be the alchemy, honestly, uh, Kathy, of just all these things happening at once. So medicines, VNS, Afinitor, you know, we never quite know in epilepsy when we keep adding medicines and moving medicines around when you kind of get to that spot. Is it the last medicine that you added? Is it that medicine plus all the other stuff? Is there some kind of long range change in the circuitry that you've now finally achieved? I don't really know the answer. I don't think it is well, well understood. Um, suffice it to say though, that many people get on sort of a combination that seems to work reasonably well. There's good evidence from patient um, quality of life studies to suggest that um, being seizure free doesn't necessarily define quality of life and many patients would rather have a couple of seizures rather than being fully sedated or lethargic or tired or depressed on anti seizure medicines. So there is there is a bit of a uh, of a balance here that you have to achieve. I will say this in my experience, you know, my oldest TSC patient is 76. Um, I will say just longitudinally, as patients kind of get into their 50s and 60s, um, for whatever reason, I don't know whether things just kind of get tired or burn out a little bit, but seizures do tend to drop off. I, I, I'm trying to think of a single patient I have over the age of 60 who has really, really aggressive epilepsy. I, I can't think of anyone. So, so there is so, sort of a natural kind of a leveling out. Whether he'll be seizure free or not, I, I think is, is very difficult to know. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he has gotten a reduction with Affinitor and you know maybe the combination and Affinitor as he ages into his 50s, you know, maybe we'll see a couple of seizures maybe per year. And if that's the stasis, that's the homeostasis you get to, you know, from a quality of life perspective in other epilepsies, many patients find that fully, fully tolerable. Uh, Dana has a question. Is there a medication that is prescribed more for seizures during sleep? Derek, you want to? 
think yeah. that. So I, I think there's a few ways to, um, uh, to, to slice that question. One is uh, certain types of seizures are more likely to occur out of sleep, and uh, that, that would be in the form of things like tonic seizures. So there are medications that are more commonly uh, prescribed and have been shown to be uh, effective for tonic seizures. So um, um, th those types of medications, you know, ones I would speak with your treatment provider would be with things like clobazam, uh, rufinamide, um, uh, being two of the, the more uh, commonly thought about medications in those situations you can uh, speak with your treatment provider about. Um, also, uh, uh, the uh, CBD compound, cannabidiol, is another one that has been looked at um, and re reducing seizure burden in that population and, and that, those types of seizures. Um, the other aspect is just, you know, all types of seizures that occur more frequently at night. And uh, an aspect there would be working toward the treatment paradigm of if they're preferentially occurring at night uh, to consider, you know, is there, are there medications that are given more during the nighttime? There's certainly any of our, any medications can have an asymmetric dosing towards nighttime and any of the medications that have a daily dosing as well can be um, dosed once at night as well, where you can ameliorate any daytime symptoms with a peak effect of the medication levels at nighttime. So really, um, you know, that's something I would, you can definitely work with your treatment provider on to see what um, uh, form of those options, whether it's medications that are specific for those types of seizures that occur at night, or if it's an asymmetric dosing of medication, or is it one of those once a day medications that, you know, that daily dose could be the one time at night to have a peak effect uh, in the overnight hour. So there's a lot of different treatment paradigms that can be considered. And I think it really uh, depends on a lot of factors, other medications being taken, um, the nature of the type of seizures. There's a lot of variables that go into it, but I think those are all considerations that can factor into picking medications that are right for nighttime seizures. Perfect, thank you. I think I have one more question that came in ahead of the webinar. Um, and it said, if possible, um, can you address seizure control versus overall health? And is there any correlation to that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, um, I don't, I don't want to be uh, uh, too sober, but I mean, seizures are, are not good for your general health. That is actually true. There's, there's very good data um, that, that seizures promote morbidity in the form of injury, uh, in the form of long-term effects on just on metabolism and on the body, bone health, lipid metabolism, cholesterol levels. Uh, we know that obviously there are effects that are unique in women compared to men that have to do with risk for birth defects, um, changes in um, hormone fluctuations, um, alterations in the menstrual cycle, changes in lactation. So there's all kinds of things that, that seizures can be difficult and challenging for the human body. There's very good evidence that there is a cumulative effect of lots and lots of seizures on the brain's ability to um, maintain adequate function. There are studies in children that recurrent seizures lead to decrease in IQ points. Um, so, so we come at this perspective, you know, pretty aggressively. We want them to stop. It's not just a, uh, oh, we just wanted to stop. It's, it's really to promote general health for sure. Um, you know, um, I, I think a conversation that many of us have is the risk of, of sudden death with uh, recurrent and intractable epilepsy. It's something that, that um, when I was in training, we were, were very hesitant about discussing with families. But, but now, because there's just been so many studies, um, it's considered good practice to have that conversation with family members and patients. So they realize really just the, the gravity of the diagnosis of recurrent seizures. So yeah, there is a, an accumulated healthcare deficit over time from having intractable epilepsy. Um, however, uh, I've seen an awful lot of people who've had bad epilepsy for a long time, and then they either have epilepsy surgery or a device placed, or they find that one medicine that works. Um, and, you know, in a short matter of time, they look pretty good and they're back to feeling uh, pretty well and their intellectual mood improves, their intellectual function improves. So I don't think it's, it's, it's permanent. I, it just, it does get to a situation when you're having lots and lots of recurrent seizures. In addition, just to the time spent being in a seizure, coming out of a seizure, recovering from a seizure, as well as the injuries. Um, yeah, it's not good for, for brain health, for sure. And that's why we really try so avidly to make your seizures, uh, make your seizures come under control. Um, so yeah, I do think there is a cumulative health burden and, and it's one of the drivers of why we work so hard to make them stop. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we got one final question in the chat and then we will wrap it up just to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, so they noted they're on Vimpat, Lamictal, Tobamax, and Keppra and still having seizures. Is there a better way to control them? They are 40 years, a 40 year old male and also having to take naps every day. Is that normal? Derek, you want to handle that? Uh, that's a, that's a uh, kind of a, a big question. So I think that's one that's going to require discussion with your treating neurologist to talk through, you know, uh, are more medications an option or are these other things we've talked about tonight an option, including the devices or, um, uh, you know, as Pete mentioned, the, the other medications. Uh, there's many different pathways that can come in the setting of refractory epilepsy and the unwelcome medication. It really takes kind of taking into consideration all these different variables we've spoken about tonight to decide which one is the right pathway. So there are many different non-medication options to consider, but and there's a lot of individual treatment variables that would have to be considered in, uh, in each clinical context to sort that out. All right. Thank you both to Drs. Bauer and Crino for all of the great information. We appreciate your time, your compassion, your dedication, and of course, your expertise to the TSC community. Thank you all for participating tonight. And thank you again to our presenting sponsor of the 2021 e-webinar series, Greenwich Biosciences, and our national support sponsors, UCB Inc. and Novartis. The Life Stages webinar series is sponsored by Libanova, Lundbeck, Mallinckrodt, Norellis, and Upshur Smith Laboratories. This concludes our 2021 e-webinar series. To access recordings of all previous e-webinars, please visit www.tscalliance.org forward slash e-webinars. Thank you all and have a great evening. Take care. Hi everyone, take care.